I can assure you that what you will observe is a vast wasteland. To try and channel it for good. Free and uncorrupted communication. Marcello is professor of physics at Dartmouth. Um, he's the author of The Dancing Universe, From Creation Myths to the Big Bang. He is the moderator of Writing Cosmology. I'm very proud of uh, being the moderator of such a panel. You know, this is just great. You know, I've, uh, I've known Marsha for a long time. This was a postdoc at uh, Fermilab. It was, you know, just beginning, and she was there already, you know, at the fringes talking about cosmic strings and stuff. And uh, what we plan to do is um, to be very brief. Each one of us will have a very brief statement. You know, we talked about three minutes or five. And, and the goal is to put some ideas on the table and then have the audience you know, discuss with us. And uh, so let me, um, I'm sure you've met all of us already, but let me again introduce in case you just came in. Um, I have here Alan Lightman, you know, who is, um, an astrophysicist and a very distinguished nonfiction and fiction writer. I have Marsha Bartusek, who was just introduced, but I'll do it again. You know, she's, she's teaching uh, science writing at MIT graduate program. She's the author of four books, most recently the one which is a fantastic idea, is the, ar is the Archives of the Universe, which in which she basically put together uh, real, uh, the original text, you know, from Ptolemy and Kepler, et cetera, and Newton, to describe how our views of the universe changed in time. And then I have Sean Carroll, who is a professor at the University of Chicago and a fellow cosmologist, who has a fantastic distinction of not only having written a textbook while he was not tenured, but also... Um, <laughs> But also, have, I don't know how you pull this, you know, he also taught a course called uh, The History of Atheism yeah. at the University of Chicago, and I think that's just fantastic. And then last but not least, I have Jenna, whom I've also known for a very long time. Uh, she is a professor at Barnard College now and an astrophysicist, and she has written this book, which is a wonderful book called How the Universe Got Its Spots, and she has something coming out, which is a nameless book apparently for now, but promises to be really interesting. Okay, so to the panel itself. Um, uh, the title of this panel is Writing Cosmology. And I love the, the title because I find it, 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 it sort of, ha it has a double meaning because you could say writing about cosmology, you know, so how do we write about cosmology to people who are not, uh, you know, working with cosmology? But there's another interpretation, which is the one I think we should explore here more, which is writing cosmology, which really means, you know, being part of a very old tradition, which is that since the beginning of civilization, you know, we had to be outside in the world and we tried to make meaning of the world and we tried to translate what we saw into some kind of narrative. And so the oldest things that put us together, in a sense, as a culture, are creation myths. Myths that describe somehow how the universe came to be, how something came out of nothing, you know, which is one of perhaps the most complicated questions you can ask, right? How, how is that possible? So, so different cultures came up with different ideas, you know, and of course, Genesis is a very popular one. Uh, there are many others, for example, the Maori Indians of New Zealand say that uh, nothing came out of nothing. There was no God, no goddess, nothing, and suddenly, just from the urge to exist, the universe popped out, you know, so sort of, uh, which is a good thing, because there's some modern theories that say very similar things about cosmology. But the point here is that um, I think writing cosmology, in a sense, is, is the way in which we use the conceptual framework of science nowadays to be part of this old cultural um, tradition of making sense of the world and, 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 and who we are. 
And so back to the question that the, the original, the, the former panel talked about, which is why is it that cosmology is so appealing to the general public as opposed to condensed matter physics, for example. And I think the key reason for that is because it is part of this tradition in which we try to understand who we are. And it's a very big question. It's a question that is much older than science is. It's a question that has to do with religion originally, right? And that has been transformed through science into cutting edge research stuff. But it's something that people want to know more than about transistors or other things. So I think there is a very deep reason for that. There's a reason that cosmologists, in a sense, are following on the footsteps of, of meaning-making people. Okay. The other thing, quickly, I wanted to make a point of, and I hope the panel will address this, is that uh, whenever you're doing cutting-edge science, there's a lot of stuff that we don't know if it's right or if it's wrong. You know? And so, for example, we dream of, of ideas such as multiverses, you know, or 10, 11 dimensional theories, which may or may not be, be right. And it's the role of these ideas, you know, in the creative process of the scientist, similar to the role of myth making, you know, in, in, in general cultures and, and how effective this is. And do we need these things? If we don't have these things, you know, we just don't go forward in a sense. You know, Kepler had the dream that everything was geometry. And, and because of that dream, he came up with these laws of, of planetary motion, which almost embarrass him because they don't quite fit in this geometric framework that he had. But still, so the dream kind of was the thing that pushed him forward. So I will stop now and I'll just let's go down. There's no order here, you know, let's just go down, I guess, from here on. Alan, please. Uh, well, I, I think this is a, a very exciting time period of history to be writing about cosmology. Uh, because uh, modern cosmology is a fairly young science, just started in uh, 1917 with Einstein's uh, theory of general relativity, uh, actually his, his cosmological model. And uh, new instruments uh, in the last decade have allowed us to make huge advances in cosmology. Uh, uh, particularly by measuring the radio waves that are left over from the Big Bang uh, to very high accuracy with satellites above the Earth's atmosphere. We've been able to, to learn a tremendous amount uh, about cosmology. Uh, and what's so exciting to me is, is even though we have made great advances, uh, we have uncovered enormous puzzles that have the, the, the cosmologists themselves um, and the physicist without any explanation. Um, and I, I just wanted to mention two of those puzzles. Um, there's a large amount of matter in the universe that we can't see and we don't know what it is. We have uh, indirect uh, evidence of it from its gravitational effects. It's called dark matter. And, and this is uh, a large percentage of the total mass of the universe, much more than the matter we see is the matter we don't see and we don't know what it is. Uh, we have no idea what it is. Um, in the last few years, we have discovered uh, observationally that there is a, an anti-gravitational force, uh, which is called dark, uh, well, it's, it's represented as dark energy, as a, as, as a term that's sometimes used to describe it. But it's, it's a repulsive gravitational force. Uh, and its magnitude, when expressed in terms of its equivalent mass, is about the same as the, the amount of matter that we don't see, the, 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 un, uh, the dark matter. And why, first of all, we don't know exactly what causes the, the, the dark energy. Um, and second of all, we are totally perplexed as to why its amount should be approximately equal to the amount of the dark matter. Um, there's no theoretical understanding of why those two amounts should be the same. They're both things that we don't see, that we just have indirect evidence of. So there's a vast, there's something really strange going on or something beautiful that we don't understand about uh, modern cosmology when there's something that they don't understand. Um, 
when you look at, at some of the great revolutions uh, in science, uh, uh, for, for example, the, the, uh, they're always preceded, almost always preceded by a period of being stumped over a problem and not uh, having uh, not having any explanation, knowing that there's something that we don't understand. For example, when we, when we knew that, that uh, in 1900 that, that atoms, hot atoms emitted light at only certain frequencies, and those certain frequencies had certain patterns like certain musical notes on a scale, but we had no understanding of why they had those patterns. That was also a period like today with cosmology where uh, it was a tremendously uh, stimulating confusion. And uh, that's the confusion we have right now with cosmology and, and people who work on it are very excited that, uh, that, uh, that there's this vast stuff that we don't understand and maybe there will be a, a conceptual breakthrough sometime in our, in our lifetimes. I totally, I was going to make similar remarks. Um, Marcello mentioned cosmology being one of our oldest endeavors, and actually I think of it as one of the newest endeavors. Uh, Alan briefly mentioned that also, uh, because until around um, the uh, early 1900s, uh, cosmology was really a philosophical pursuit. There were some observations. They saw these little fuzzy nebulae, nebulae in the sky, and there was speculation whether they were other island universes. But it was just that. It was speculation. And then there was this great moment. It was the perfect storm in some ways, both with Einstein introducing his theory of general relativity and the introduction of the great telescopes, the 100-inch telescope at Mount Wilson, which enabled Edwin Hubble and Milton Humason uh, to discover not only that there were other galaxies, but they were fleeing outward in a specific way, which indicated that the universe was indeed expanding, that the universe was something far different than had ever been imagined before. That was really the start of modern cosmology, was that moment in which you had a mathematical set of equations that could physically describe and make predictions about the nature and structure of the universe. It was no longer just your imagination of coming up with schemes, uh, mythical, legendary schemes on how the, how the universe came about. And from that point forward, there has been a sort of really a, a, a forward march of studying the universe both through astronomical observations and, uh, as Alan pointed out, the um, uh, the exquisite uh, uh, look at the microwave background, the, the remnant echo, the remnant radiation that is now filling the universe from the primeval fireball. Um, what I find interesting, when you look back at history with various cosmological models, first we had Ptolemy with his crystalline spheres. And though we laugh about that now, it was actually a very powerful model which could make predictions about planetary movements. And then it was stretched too far. It started breaking down. And lo and behold, uh, Copernicus stepped in to, to bring a simplification and a better understanding and a whoa moment of, yes, that makes much better sense to have the sun in the center. And then that was carried through until it sort of stretched the, the point of observations when we always thought we were the center of the Milky Way. And then observation showed, no, that was not true. We were actually pushed off to the side. And then with Hubble, the Milky Way galaxy itself, which is one of many billions of other galaxies, there are these sort of leaps of always changing our model. And I feel, I wanted to bring this up, I feel like we're at this critical moment when you start having to, to uh, uh, call things dark matter, dark energy, that's a big flashing sign. Something's, <laughs> something's wrong with this model. And I really wonder if we're at a moment at which we're going to have not just an, an added detail to our cosmological model, but is this a signal that maybe we're going to have to change our model altogether? Of course, we don't know. It, it may uh, uh, fizzle out in the end uh, to just another uh, extension um, 
uh, in, a minor, in a minor way. Uh, but is it the indication of something else? It just, you know, if it walks like a duck, quacks like a duck. <laughs> I, I just, I get very uncomfortable as a writer when I have to describe things in terms of dark matter, dark energy. Um, it's, it's a real sign to me having that historic perspective of having just gone through the whole history of astronomy that uh, it sounds like something else is at work here. And I'm, I'm very excited to, to be in an era where there may be another big shift in our thoughts about what the universe is really like. I just want to make a quick comment on that. What promotes all these astronomical uh, revolutions, as I said, what happened, for example, in the Renaissance was data. In that sense, cosmology sort of came of age because it's not data-driven science, which was not the case 25 years ago. And, and there, now there's this union between cosmology, the science of the universe at large, with the microcosm. Um, I think the mystery of the dark matter may truly be found in new particle physics with uh, theories that may, uh, theories that at this moment are telling us that there may be additional particles of matter surrounding us that are only really um, seen through their gravitational force but don't interact with us very deeply uh, through any other uh, force and why they have been so difficult to detect at this moment. So that's a new, actually, era of cosmology is in the sense we've, we've united the macrocosm with the microcosm uh, in a beautiful way. And it's, it's very interesting to, uh, to observe the interaction of the particle physics with the, with the cosmologists. And this is something that has really just been generated over the last 20 years. Uh, and that's an exciting new area of cosmology. Sean? So I think if this conference were arbitrarily long, it would be fun to have more short talks about actual science. We're going to get um, Joe Polchinski is going to explain quantum electrodynamics to us, so I'm looking forward to that. But uh, and there's all sorts of wonderful topics that, as we say, are source material for literary um, adventures, and we could, you know, have discussions about entropy and the arrow of time and uh, all these wonderful things. But um, but what I was th thought about, I would mention today, is actually something that is not so much on the cutting edge, something we actually understand. One of the things that we uh, come, which is, which is the expansion of the universe. Uh, Einstein, as uh, has just been mentioned, figured out general relativity in the 19 teens. And general relativity says that what you and I think of as gravity is a manifestation of the curvature of space time. And one way that space time can be curved is that the universe can expand. We have an equation that tells us how the universe expands. If you have certain kinds of stuff, we might be confused about the stuff, but the expansion is something we actually understand at the level of equations. It fits the data very, very well. When, as scientists, we try to explain certain things to the public or to uh, writers or journalists, sometimes we have trouble articulating what we're saying because we are confused. When we talk about dark energy, we don't know what it is. When we talk about string theory or quantum mechanics, part of our uh, imperfect communication is that there's imperfect uh, thing that we are trying to communicate. However, for the expanding universe is not like that. We understand it basically perfectly. I, I can write down the equations. If you ask me a, a question about what will happen under certain circumstances, I can give you the answer. Nevertheless, it is hard <laughs> to make people understand what is going on if they don't have those equations. There is um, something of a language barrier for example. And I think that uh, one of the things that we have to recognize is that we typically don't invent new words out of whole cloth when we talk about new scientific achievements. We borrow words from the pre-existing language. Uh, and when we use words like energy or expansion or dimension or dark, uh, <laughs> these words have pre-existing meanings. And one of the problems with the concept, like when we say, well, 70% of the universe is dark energy, the problem with that, one of the problems with that statement is not that no one knows what dark energy is, but that people think they have an idea of what it might be on the basis of their pre-existing experience with darkness and energy. And they're not right. And uh, one of my proudest moments as a science popularizer was when I gave a talk on dark energy and uh, I got a question from the audience that was um, uh, a woman in the back raised her hand and said very politely, I'm, I'm very impressed with the 70% of the universe's dark energy. Do you think that the 
this concept of dark energy could have any connection with the Chinese concept of qi energy. And I said, well, the dark energy, I mean, it's easy, it would be very tempting to say no. <laughs> Uh, so I did, but I prefaced it with, with the actual explanation. I said, you know, dark energy, the only thing we know about dark energy is that it's perfectly smooth, not evolving in space or time, not interacting with any of the, of the particles that we know and love. So whatever dark energy is, it does not have any way to influence human behavior in any way, and therefore I do not think it is the Chinese concept of qi energy. <laughs> I think it's actually the right answer, but, but she had a perfectly legitimate question. It's not at all a bad question. You know, I've heard of kinds of energy before. Could we use dark energy to, you know, free ourselves from uh, dependence on foreign oil sources? Is another perfectly good <laughs> question. But okay, but the expansion of the universe <laughs> is no. <laughs> For exactly the same reason, we can't do anything. It's the most useless kind of energy there is. Ask about black holes is a different question, but dark energy, no. If it's it not can't do work, is it energy? It, it provides employment for cosmologists. What else do we need from dark energy? But the fact that the universe is expanding is something that even the students in my graduate general relativity class struggle with. Even though they can do the equations, they'll ask a question like, well, if the universe is expanding, does that mean that I'm expanding? And I, and I can say no, or I can say, you know, if you are expanding, it's not because of the expansion of the universe. It's because of, you know, the muffins at uh, the coffee brain. <laughs> uh, but, they, but they don't quite buy it you know, until they work through the equations themselves because there's, it's hard to explain what that means because it's not something that we deal with in our everyday human interactions. So a couple days ago, I was, I was promoting the idea that science is a wonderful source material for metaphors to help us think about everyday human life. Today I would like to uh, just lament the fact that everyday human life is terrible source material for metaphors to help us understand science sometimes. Uh, and the expanding universe is a really good example. It's really tempting when you talk about the expanding universe to appeal to different metaphorical analogies. The favorite one being the balloon, and there's little dots on the surface of the balloon, and the balloon is expanding. And I hate that analogy for the expanding universe because the scientist who gives it says, okay, you have a balloon and it's expanding and the dots are moving apart and that's like the universe. But the inside of the balloon, so pretend that's not there. And we're, the whole universe is just the balloon. But no one to whom you give this analogy can successfully pretend that the inside of the balloon is not there. <laughs> they think that there's, and they say, well, what is expanding away from? What is it expanding into? And you're like, why are you asking me these questions? And they should say, because you gave me such a bad metaphor. <laughs> Well, that is not at all like the universe. What I've tried to do is actually to explain the expansion of the universe by being resolutely non-metaphorical and saying, imagine you're standing outside on a clear night and you can see everything in the universe with perfect precision and you can take the spectra with your eyes perfectly well. You would see that there are galaxies and each galaxy has a trillion stars in it and all the galaxies are moving away from us. And if you just close your eyes and imagine this happening, all the galaxies have a distance between them that is increasing that's the expansion of the universe. And there's no referent to things outside the expanding universe. And I don't know whether this works. <laughs> this is what I attempt to do. I think it removes certain things. The other famous metaphor or analogy is the raisin bread. You put the raisin bread in, but raisin bread has a crust and it's in an oven. And none of those <laughs> things are true for the universe. How do, you, how do you get around them thinking they're the center of the universe with that everything flying away from them? Well, in practice, what I do is I say, okay, now imagine that you are in one of those galaxies. What would you see? Well, you would see us moving away just as fast. Everyone, I think that you can at least make the claim, whether or not they buy it, that everyone in this uh, universe, as we call it, uh, would see a similar thing. But, I'm not, but I'm, I'm not putting this forward because I think it's the right answer because I have a, a, a track record of miserable failure when it comes to explaining the concept of extra dimensions of space. And I would love it if someone would help me explain this concept of extra dimensions. So, you know, I use the metaphors. I talk about the garden hose and the ant and the type rope and all the <laughs> straw and all those things. And I remember I was on live radio once being interviewed and, and about extra dimensions. And I gave this little explanation of what I think extra dimensions would be in terms of the garden hose or whatever. And the host said, I'm not sure I quite get that. Could you, could you explain that again in a different way? And I said, <laughs> No, I, 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 I couldn't do it. I, I'm at a loss as to explain this. And again, you know, once the equations are just not so hard. But so it's a wonderful thing to think about 
how we can best explain these things that we actually do understand really well. I mean, then there's a whole other thing to think about how we can explain the things that we're clueless about, like uh, dark matter and the arrow of time and the multiverse and stuff like that. Uh, but it's, you know, it's, we've gotten people excited about it. We need to do a little bit better job of getting them informed about it. Well, I want to harken back to something um, Marcelo said about um, this being an ancient question. I really, um, I like that image, you know, and it's clearly true that we've been asking questions about cosmology ever since we could ask questions. And I think that there's something in that um, very idea that, that speaks about something about the universal human condition. And I'm not sure what it is exactly. Maybe somebody will have some insights. But it seems that you know, a very long time ago, we clambered onto two legs. We started doing cave paintings. We started having imagination. We started talking about where we came from. And we started recording these ideas. And um, very far down the line, we have these very elaborate civilizations that begin to think that they're great. You know, we are great. Human beings are the center of the universe, and that's something Marsha brought up. So we become not just, you know, we, we go from, um, you know, being on all fours to standing on two legs to having cave paintings to thinking we are the center of the universe. And then a small group of people um, stand on the shore of the planet, look out into space, and do something that I think is really remarkable. They confess their insignificance. And they look out into space, not just at the clouds and not just at the atmosphere, but further to the stars and possibly even further, like Kant, which you also brought up, imagining galaxies, that these little smudges might actually be island universes. And we get to the point where we realize, looking into that depth, that really completely remarkable expanse of space, that we're not much. <laughs> and that's, I think, a huge thing to confess. And as we get further and further along in our theories with Einstein and then with um, uh, Alpha, who was brought up, and Herman and Gamow, and um, people to admit that maybe we're just an ashy residue of the Big Bang. We're just, a, and especially now that we look at the constituents of the universe, and we realize that the material that we're made of is a, is a minute fraction of what's out there. We're like a bit of leftover dust, essentially. And, um, and to, to have that admission, I think, is when we become great. So I love that bittersweet combination that we're able to say, we're not at the center of the universe. We're not at the center of the galaxy. We're not even at the center of the solar system. But um, that places us at the center of our stories. And I think that somehow this is why it makes such a great story. It's that combination of greatness and weakness, of significance and insignificance. And I think that's also what's so powerful in the great biographies of scientists. It's not people who have had flawless, simple lives who um, it traversed everything so easily and made their great achievements. Those are very dull stories. Um, it's the combination of the two. And, and as in somebody like Kurt Gödel, who I brought up yesterday, who was a great genius, possibly the greatest logician since Aristotle, possibly greater than Aristotle, uh, yet was a paranoid schizophrenic. It's that combination that's so amazing. It's the, it's the idea that greatness is doled out with an equal measure of weakness. And somehow I think that's intrinsic in our looking at the cosmos, in realizing what we are um, in the greater scheme of things. And I think that's why it lends itself to narrative and why it captures people's imaginations and why it's a question we've always needed to ask. We're looking somehow for meaning precisely in the admission that maybe um, you know, we're just a little bit of dust. And, um, and that's, that's also something I think uh, that we talked about yesterday in one of the panels, that the idea that we're a bit of dust makes people feel nervous or anxious or insignificant or purposeless. And this quote of Weinberg's came up. And I actually think uh, Stephen Weinberg's quote that, that Alan brought up, which I'm not going to be able to reproduce perfectly, actually um, saying that there is less meaning in the universe as we discover more, I, I don't think it leaves out that possibility that, in fact, again, that is precisely how we're finding our meaning, um, by, by making those honest admissions and looking at ourselves in the cold, hard light of uh, the way things actually are. I think it was a, a beautiful um, uh, analysis of the fact that uh, the, more we, we, the more we see we are insignificant, the more, uh, in some sense, uh, the wonder of the accomplishment that we, with our tiny brain, can look out and, and come to this, um, this concept. And I, I wonder and I worry sometimes whether with the new advances in cosmology showing that we, you know, we've constantly been removing ourselves from the center of the universe, for, first from the solar system, the Milky Way, uh, the, uh, the universe, and now the universe itself, we're thinking maybe just one of other universes, that 
we see the wonder that we have accomplished this through our intellectual en endeavors, yet I wonder if we're going to start facing the problems that um, uh, the Darwinians uh, are facing in the sense that there is the creation and creationism reaction. And w is cosmology, in a sense, also going to have uh, this um, reaction at some point where people are reacting <coughs> to the cosmological models the way they do uh, against the Darwinian models? I always sometimes, uh, in fact, I'm amazed that it isn't brought more into the discussion. Clearly, cosmological models are somehow um, in competition, not, well, not necessarily in competition with religious models. I mean, I know religious cosmologists who somehow find a way. Um, to meld those things. But it is clearly saying that the religious model is not going to answer my questions. I'm going to com continue to pursue questions to their fullest. And um, it, you know, clearly a bend towards materialism emerges, I think, um, from these discussions. So I, I don't know why. There hasn't been more out. Where's all the outrage? <laughs> Let me try to propose an answer. I don't know if it's right or wrong. But I think the answer, at least from in the minds of, of, of most people, is that Unless cosmology can do away with the problem of first cause, it will always have room for religion. You know? and, and, and you can build the most sophisticated model using quantum mechanics and general relativity and come up with a quantum cosmological way of describing the beginning of the universe. You always need an initial condition. You, know? you always need a way to make that thing pop into existence. And, and it is this thing which is completely, it's ingrained in the way science is done. We cannot get around that unless we invent a new kind of science, which we haven't. And uh, we always will have room for people to say, aha, well, who determined the initial condition that created this universe we live in? You know? And that's a real problem. That sounds like a relatively sophisticated uh, reasoning for why uh, people don't have the reaction against cosmology they do against evolution. I think there's a couple more prosaic explanations. One is that the statement that the universe is 14 billion years old and came from a Big Bang affects us slightly less viscerally than the statement that our ancestors were monkeys. <laughs> and then that is, and people, you know, if you hear the actual rhetoric, that is what bothers a lot of people. There's an even more prosaic explanation, which is that cosmology is not taught in high schools in the same way that biology and evolution are. So uh, what I would like to see happen is that everyone graduating from high school must be taught about the Big Bang. Which, which is one reason the Catholic Church uh, did not make a ruckus uh, about the Big Bang, having the Galileo. <laughs> they learned their lesson with Galileo because they felt they could accommodate it within um, the mythic structure of uh, the Judeo-Christian uh, uh, writings. So that uh, there's more of a mesh, I think. There's this story uh, about um, Stephen Hawking gave one of the earliest talks on quantum cosmology and the wave function of the universe at a conference that was sponsored by the Vatican in Rome. And the Pope gave the sort of closing remarks and at which he said, you know, uh, I'm very happy that all you scientists are here. We've learned a lot about God's creation by studying the universe. And the only thing that you're not allowed to think about is where the universe came from. And apparently no one had told him <laughs> that Hawking had gave, given a talk on exactly that. Uh, so, yeah, so it might not be, I mean, it might be that Marcel is right and that, uh, you know, if, as people are, because people are certainly proposing models of the universe in which there is not an initial condition. And maybe that would start bugging people more. I don't know. Actually, I have a scientific uh, uh, digression, which is that I think that the fact that there are initial conditions in the way we model the Big Bang is clearly a mistake, <laughs> and that we should be we should be exactly as Sean just said, looking at models where either they somehow contain their own creation, like Richard Gott did, or or even I know I've got Godel on the brain, but Godel Godelian structures are things where. Um, the very principle you're talking about contains itself, like the set of all sets or something like that. And so you, you know, I think that we should be thinking about models mm -hmm. that are so self-referential that they contain themselves and their own laws, and therefore initial conditions must somehow also come out. But I mean, I do think it's a Emerging shortcoming of the way we condition. think. You know, I think we think <laughs> about it in a sort of, you know, the intuition that the rest of the world also has, what was before. We're, you know, we're still thinking about it in that way as cosmologists. Well, well uh, I think, as Sean uh, alluded to, there are models, and one of them is due to Stephen Hawking in 1982, um, that, as you know, that, that don't need to specify initial conditions. And in fact, 
uh, if quantum mechanics applies in the early universe, and we certainly think that it did, um, then there are the, the meaning of time itself uh, ceases to exist in any way that we understand it now. Um, that, that we now think that, uh, at least speaking in the universe that we know about, there, there are three space dimensions and one time dimension. That um, if you go, uh, if, if quantum, uh, quantum effects start becoming important on the nature of space and time, which they, they would have at near the beginning of the universe in all models, that the time dimension of does not behave like a time dimension that we're familiar with now. That it starts taking on characteristics of space dimensions and the whole concept of, of time and a beginning lose their meaning in, in the language and understanding that we have now. So that, that's one way in which uh, the, the, the question, where we, the, the question uh, that we're asking about the initial conditions uh, ceases to have meaning in the way that we're asking it. He put it, uh, it's as you're, you're standing right at the North Pole, where is North? <laughs> that was the way Hawking put it in his book. It's semantics because he used boundary <laughs> conditions, you know, and that's yes, really the same thing, no. honestly. I, I don't believe that's getting away from the problem. You, the way science is formulated, you cannot get away from this problem. At least, unless you do something revolutionary like what you're mentioning. Well, aren't there That's also my opinion. cosmological schemes now where you have a continual inflation popping off in different areas so that, right. in a sense, we're back to the steady state universe, right. but in a different way? Right. <laughs> but then you can ask what would cause one particular region of space-time to, to inflate into a new universe. What was the, that quantum, the quantum mechanical fl fluctuation, quantum fluctuation yeah. that led to that? And you might be uh, then get back to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, where even as a matter of principle, you cannot predict what would cause a given universe to come into being. Right. This is great because we're talking about science, but yes. uh, I, and also because my most recent paper was saying exactly this: that the universes are just constantly generated out of a pre-existing space-time, and there's no point at the beginning. So I think that all these things are on the table. We don't know the answers. You know, I used to like a few years ago. I used to make statements when people would say, well, what about the Big Bang? I would say, well, you know, that's, that's a boundary and uh, laws of physics break down and so forth. Now I just say, well, we don't know. <laughs> I'm more honest, because we just don't know, and who knows? But we do know some things. For example, you said that we do know that the universe we're in now is expanding. Yes. And we, we, have, we can look at the galaxies and our telescopes and see, measure their velocities and their distances and see that the universe is expanding in all directions. So. Um, we may not know about all of these other universes and the multiverses and so on, but we do know that the universe that we're in is, is expanding. And was much smaller right. and hotter. And was much, right. much smaller and denser and hotter than it is now. One right. of the very right. important things to do is to, is to impress people both with how much we do know how and where the boundary is. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. It's just because I think there are a ton of questions from the audience. That's all. <laughs> so I may. Uh, Tony, let's go from right to left, I guess. Uh, as far as I can remember, and, my, and I think my memory is still reasonably good, even at my age, um, I think what he said was not whether the universe has meaning. I think the exact quote is more like, the more we understand about the universe, the more pointless it pointless. seems. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And I actually want to ask the panelists, if you guys are so smart, what is the point of the universe? Oh, I, know. Oh, I, know. I know that one. Know. Yeah, no, no. No, oh, no, you, <laughs> no you go first. No, you first. <laughs> <laughs> I just think he was right. There's no point except what we give it, which is not to be denigrated. It, no, it's not. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, we're pretty, we're pretty interesting. We make great stories. We have this great imagination. That's. Uh, See, that's the point. Just because go we're not at the center of the define, universe. Define a point. Go to play. Go to play. That's the point. Of the just because we're not at the center of the universe doesn't mean we're not the most interesting bit of it. <laughs> Until we find another interesting bit, and then it'll be nice to compare. I that's think right. that's part of our problem in the human condition is we have no other intelligence to compare ourselves. <clears throat> and I think that is going to be one of the most biggest revolutions for us if we ever do come in contact with uh, another Can intelligence. Tell us what the point of the universe is? Well, they'll have their own point. <laughs> they'll probably have their own point. We all, I mean, we're all egocentric, aren't we? I mean, I think any intelligence, just by the very nature of evolution, we want to survive. 
we want to be our own center of our own universe in order to survive. So I think it's inbuilt into the human mechanism, that survival sense that makes us want to be the center of the universe, each and every one of us. Yeah. How does it make you feel to know what you know about the universe? Not from a scientific point of view, but from a human point of view. Or does that not, have you trained yourself out of that? I mean, in some way, I don't know if I could bear to do what you do, because I'm already upset just thinking about <laughs> <laughs> Woody Allen feels about this. I don't know if you guys remember. I think it was Annie Hall. And he has this like nervous breakdown as a kid because he realizes the universe is expanding. And his mother says to him, uh, you know, what business is it of yours? You live in Brooklyn. Brooklyn is not expanding. You know? um, but um, I, I think, you know, if you look at the story, and I'm sure many people know the story, even Einstein did not want to accept this. And, and I think when he, he he was told that his equations implied the expansion of the universe. It's a very well-known story that he introduced something called the cosmological constant to try to stop this expansion from happening. And he later called it his greatest blunder. And I think, you know, I'm, I'm sure I'm projecting, but um, not because it was his greatest mathematical error. He had a lot of struggles with the mathematics and non Riemannian geometry, but because it was sort of um, a, a blunder of belief, you know, that he allowed what he believed and wanted to believe to, to alter um, his sort of scientific ideas. And so that's why it was such a huge blunder, because actually the cosmological constant is still very important in our theories. And, but, um, but so I, I kind of pushed your question off onto other people, how other people <laughs> reacted. And yeah, I mean, I guess, um, I guess I've not. Tr the vision of yeah, it all. I yeah. mean, I, I comp I, I'm very at home with that. Yes. I just. I love a good tragic story, you know. <laughs> And also, I, I have not trained myself out of it for sure, I can say that, and I think part of writing is, is just to indulge in that for a little while and to use plain English to talk about it. You know, and I sit with my colleagues and we're talking about finite universes. We say things like, you know, you take the manifold modulo, the diffeomorphisms of the, you know, the isometry. I mean, we t it's ridiculous. And then only much later, when I start to have to t explain it to my mom, do, can I say, you know, what we're really after is whether or not the universe is infinite. And even it hits me in the solar plexus in a totally different way than it did for the year and a half when I was calculating using three-dimensional topology. And, um, and I think that the writing, since that is a topic of the panel, is a way of sort of just expressing and indulging in that a little bit. I, I mean, I love Jana's word, bittersweet, and I'm totally going to steal that because it's, <laughs> it's so good. Uh, because on the one hand, you're right. You know, we feel a little bit insignificant here in this big universe that doesn't really care about us at all. Uh, on the other hand, you can't help but be amazed at the fact that we can understand as much of it as we can. And I love using the example of Big Bang nucleosynthesis because it seems so prosaic, you know, making, turning protons and neutrons into helium, okay? But what it means is that in the last hundred years, we went from being completely clueless about cosmology to being able to take a 14 billion year old universe and extrapolate it back to a time when the universe was one second old and make a prediction and get it exactly right. And to me, that's like the most profound fact in physics, that we understand what the universe was doing when it was one second old. What right do we have <laughs> to understand that? But we do. So you take the good with the bad. Um, wow. Yeah. <laughs> but there's another competing system called astrology. <clears throat> and, and in some ways, you know, astrology is the big competitor. and when I once taught something on astrology and, and alchemy and mesmerism during a period at MIT, um, you have to ask yourself the question, why does two-thirds the population believe in astrology when our astronomy is so good? And I think it answers a little bit of your question. Uh, when you think about, I mean, I'll think about something closer like the sun. Right now on the sun, every second, 600 million tons of hydrogen are changing into 596 million tons of helium and 4 million tons, I'm going to use the English system, of mass is disappearing. Every second, 4 million tons by E equal mc squared. And this has been going on for 5 billion years and it's going to go on for another 5 billion years. And you tell me you got problems? I mean, in some ways, you know. <laughs> so, 
<laughs> so I think the ancient, the ancient idea, now why, I'm, I'm just saying, no, but astrology is saying something to people, you know, when you're trying to understand what are they really saying, what they're saying is when I am born and another soul comes into the universe, the stars, the moon, the things pause for a moment to accept this new soul and it matters. And, and, and in some sense, and in some sense, wow, that's also very appealing to an emotional thing. And so every time we try, we physicists try to squash astrology, we're missing the point. Mm -hmm. And the point is when you read your horoscope, and everyone says all the horoscopes are no good and all and all, but you read your horoscope and what does it say today? It says today, check your finances, call some old friends, and you know, look into this. That's about as good advice as you get from anybody. <laughs> and, if, and if you followed that, your life would be perfectly fine. It's as rational as... So I think we're, you know, there's another point here, and, and, and it maybe answers your... That is the first time, actually, I have felt so patronized by a scientist at this conference. I mean, that feeling of like, oh, well, if you can't do the math, you really must be just the superstitious fool. And I think that really is unfair. I think people... Ha I mean... If my access to the wonder of, of cosmology is emotional rather than mathematical, that seems legitimate, if not scientific. Okay, let's go somewhere else. Here, at the front row. <laughs> we have a front row question here, please. So I want to get back to what you raised, Sean. Why is it so damn hard to find good metaphors so that people can understand this deeply on all levels, with their heads as, as well as their hearts? And I want to throw out a, a thought to you and see if you and the panel has a reaction. Um, a lot of the metaphors we use are visually based. You ask people to, you show them a balloon, you ask them to imagine the balloon. Uh, you said you go beyond that and say to the students, imagine yourself in a galaxy, watch the other galaxies flee away. I do that also. I teach cosmology as part of astronomy. All I get is blank incomprehension. I think there's a lack of ability to do visual, uh, visualization that is really prevalent among people in our society, I would almost describe it to computer games, actually. Because you don't need a hell of a lot of visual imagination to do a computer game. What can we do to enhance visual understanding of some of the very abstract ideas you're talking about? Is there anything we can do at all? We can do a little bit in plays, do a little bit in performance. What can we do on the printed page and in the book? So I don't know the answer. The only tiny suggestion I have is uh, as far as the universe is concerned. I mean, basically, what I'm saying is we should perhaps stop visualizing the universe from outside, since there is no outside, as far as we I mean, there may be, but in the universe, part of the universe we understand, it doesn't need to be an outside, and visualize it from inside. And that should be as easy, I think. So I would love to see planetarium displays that show a picture of many, many galaxies, and then suddenly you say, OK, now get ready, and all the galaxies start shrinking. And you would get this feeling that the galaxies are moving away from you. And you say, that's what the universe is like. Everything is moving away from you, rather than drawing a picture of it as some, OK, here's the universe kind of thing. I don't know whether that helps or not. Sometimes you just need to do it 12 times in a row. And they go, oh, OK, now I get it. You know, And we're all like that. I want to uh, bring in the fact that I think we have a con uh, not a confusion. There is a difference between teaching physics and writing on physics. And my job is not to teach physics. Uh, I often will write a story because I know the initial audience is not picking that story up or picking this book up, or maybe they are, they want you know, to, to actually learn physics. What I try as a science writer is to put people into, give them a sense of the physical process. That's why I think metaphors and analogies can be very important that, OK, in this short 5,000 or 3,000 word article, I'm not going to teach physics but I can allow this person to touch for a moment a sense of what it's like to have an enlightening moment on understanding a physical process. And I think that can be as important in communicating to a wider audience than, and, but I think, I mean, certainly teaching, say in a museum setting, something of that nature, a, a Nova special, bringing in those visuals to, to actually teach the physics can be very important. But at the same time, I think we also have to have those moments where you at least want to give people a chance to get uh, a sense of the beauty of the physical process. 
And that's where I think um, the raisin bread or the, the balloon or whatever, they at least get a sense of a picture to think about uh, that they can take away, maybe think a little more deeply, go to a physics book maybe if they have a, a further curiosity. But I don't know if our total, and I'm speaking as a science writer, I don't think that's my job. I don't want to teach people inertia, uh, you know, thermodynamics, electromagnetic uh, equations, uh, but I do want to give them a sense of how the processes work through nature. And um, so a scientist may not be perfectly at ease with that, but if I can get somebody to appreciate and think and have an emotional response, I believe an emotional response is very important. Mm -hmm. um, I would love, I would feel like I have succeeded if I got someone to read my piece and have an emotional response to it and, and have an aha moment. Oh, that makes sense to me. I get a, a little understanding now of what that means. So um, I don't know, I think we need both. If you're a musician, since you like music, you know, and you, and, you, and you can write a score, and you can read a score, and you look at the score, you have an immediate understanding, if you're really good, right, of what the music piece is about, you know. And it's the same kind of feeling with equations, you know. We look at the equations, and we have this immediate understanding, if you, if you know what you're talking about, you know, of, of what they mean and how they, uh, and in the same way that you do not have to be a musician to appreciate the beauty of a composition or the structure of the composition, the same role is played in a sense by the science writing that informs, not forms, informs people about the beauty of the scientific theories. Have you had the experience of listening to compositions by recent musical school graduates that were perhaps very technically accomplished yet missed some of the underlying emotional impact that you could get from someone who knew less? I mean, th these are two different types of understanding, and I can enjoy, uh, you know, some a, a jazz piece without knowing what key it is in. Uh, I would claim that I could know what what key it was in without, perhaps, understanding its emotional impact quite as well, or both. But I think it's a very it's a very similar. Benny, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. There was a question there first, Benny. Go ahead, please. Mathematics is a way of of seeing mm -hmm. and of picturing and. It's as real as vision or touch or smell, but it's a, it's a sense that, uh, you know, many, many, many people are uh, blind to, which is unfortunate. Uh, and it's very hard then to describe to people who don't have that sense uh, what it means. Like it's hard to describe to a blind or a deaf person what smell or sound are. But for you know those of us who are schooled in mathematics and stare at equations or think of equations every day for hours, we acquire a sixth sense. I like and think of in this, in just using that sense alone, you can picture many things that are impossible to describe using the other senses alone. To be sure, they're somewhat poorer than they are when they're combined with the other sense. So it's nice to have many to hear and see at the same time, or touch and smell. But the equations, or the mathematics, by itself is a very rich sense, sensory perception. And using that, four dimensions, five, six, a million. What's the idea? Easy. <laughs> it's true. Can I just um, come back to my Sydney's question very quickly, and, and something David also brought up about the visualization. Um, for about nine months, I was teaching in an art school which was a crazy thing to do. Yeah. yeah, I was a scientist in residence at the art school. I, mean, I don't even have a point to make, but it was very interesting um, to talk about visualizations and to see their approach to visualizations, because artists are much more ingenious. They're not just trying to do a literal representation of a three-dimensional manifold. I mean, they'll start to think in a very deep way about symbolism, about what it means to invent graphs that might represent in some deeper way um, the, the analogy, and, and it, was, it was really quite um, amazing to watch them. They weren't even interested in the traditional trying to literally visualize, because that's their whole challenge as contemporary artists, is to kind of get away from that. Um, so I, I don't know, it's not really a point. Did that affect you as a writer? Did you come away with any lessons that you've applied to your writing? <sighs> that's an interesting question. Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, it was recently. It was only a year ago that I did it. So maybe I'm still in. Ask me again in a year. <laughs>
Any questions? Uh, uh, in the arts, we're very used to teaching things that are that have no physical reality outside of um, you know of our you know mental constructs of them, and uh, it's interesting because in teaching the arts, it's you know we use metaphors, but nobody ever thinks literally that these things are actually represent what's actually happening. There, it's obviously always a metaphor, and that. Um, and that the, in the teaching of the arts is fundamentally experiential. In other words, I think of myself as, as a playwriting teacher, as a music teacher. In other words, I can explain music theory all day long, but ultimately they have to practice the piano if they want to learn how to do it. And I was thinking that in physics, I don't know, this is maybe the same way, that ultimately maybe the learning of, theory, of physics is, a, is an experiential exercise and not an intellectual exercise, and oh, yeah. that it's like practicing the piano. Yeah, well, at some more. level you can't be taught some things. You have to sit down and work through them privately and work through that math until you develop that intuition. It's not something, I've never known anyone who passively receives physics, any more than anyone passively receives language and suddenly starts being conversational. Right. And definitely maybe there's active. no way to fully understand it beyond having that experience. Yeah, and, and it requires both. Um, you need to be trained, and like we said, it's not something you're born to do. And, and there's, this, there's this fact that you can begin to understand at the level of equations and so forth without still being able to translate it back into uh, other terms. And you know, Feynman once famously said that if he couldn't uh, give a lecture on something at the level of a freshman physics class, then he didn't understand it. Right, and that's part of the, the struggle you undergo. And sometimes calculating is the easiest thing. It's just the hard part is trying to figure out what you just calculated and to try to interpret what it might, what the implications might be. And I think that's also where you see a lot of people make mistakes. And very few people make calculational errors. You know, people are pretty good, sophisticated. It's that they have mistakes of interpretation of what what their calculation meant. It makes me think are. of Dirac, who worked out his uh, Dirac uh, in uh, the 1930s. Uh, was the first to apply the special theory of relativity with quantum mechanics, and lo and behold, saw a very unusual uh, result coming out that you could have an electron, but you could have this doppelganger, an electron that looked exactly like an electron, except it had all the opposite properties. Um, and there, it, he had the bravery to decide to predict, the very, very first theorist, actually, to predict a new form of matter strictly from equations. And one year later, it was discovered. Yeah, Marcel is shaking uh, his uh, hand, because he was he not as brave as you're making it out to be. First. He did think he it was a proton. proton. OK. Yeah. Yeah. Just like yeah. Einstein blinked right. with the expanding universe. Exactly. All right. So it's well, a perfect always. example of not being good at interpreting oh, what was yeah. going okay. on. <laughs> Even the great Dirac, right? But he, he, I guess when they discovered uh, in the cosmic ray experiment in the cloud chamber, they, they saw the particle, and then yeah. It all that came was just together. A few years. It was 29 when I did it, and 32, I think, the was discovered. The first piece of so antimatter. Two years later, <laughs> but close. Yeah. Sort of the existential, desperate closing remark because I see the organizer there telling that it's time for us to close. <laughs> so I'd like to thank the panel again. Thank you. <laughs>